Oh, hello. What are you doing here? Alright. So that's Mr. Shamspear. But who's that other man beside him? Yes, I think... I feel sure that we've caught a glimpse of that man before. State your names and occupations of the court, please, witnesses. A writer of words so sweet, they do scent the breeze. An inventor of ideas so profound, they compose the earth. The unrivaled poet, the unmatched scribe William Shakespeare. Were the great bar to be recalled to life anew, lo, what a magnificent man. Good fellows, I am he who ponders such a miracle. William Shamspear. Oh, um, uh, the name's, uh, Meterman. Adron B. Meterman. So you're, you're something to do with the gas then, got it. I work for the Altamont Gas Company, East End Branch Office. Ah, I remember now. It was yesterday on Briar Road. Oh yes, she's right, it's him. Looks a bit like a bee. Oh, what's this? What's that man doing over there? It looks like he's trying to see into Soseki-san's lodgings. He's clearly not. Is something wrong, Mr. Narahodo? Um, excuse me, could I have a word? Uh, he's not trying to look into Soseki sounds, is he? Based on where the soaps are. Yes, we spotted him outside Mr. Garadev's house that morning. And he's a gas company employee? What does he have to do with this case? So, Mr. William Shamspear, you're the victim in this miserable affair, correct? Oh, heaven. Oh, hell. Do you command me to remember that sweet poison that gets cross me and cross mine innocent lips? I subpoenaed him for the trial, with his doctor's permission, naturally. Hearing the testimony of the agreed will remove any room for doubt from the jurors' minds, I'm sure. Behold, you have only to rearrange the letters of my name to see that me is a seraph, an angel indeed. Thus be I a noble of mind, sweet of nature and verily, honest of heart, as all heavenly angels be. Because there isn't a less contrived meaning in your name. No, not at all. The jurors seem to be very moved by this man. I'm afraid. Really? You're actually taking this Seraph anagram idea seriously? Thank you, witness, sir, uh, for your illuminating introductions. But my lord, what's the man next to Mr. Shamspear doing here? The gas man, I mean. Ah, uh, what? Me? Well, now, uh... Allow me to enlighten my learned friend. Recall, I presume, your earlier impertinence? When you suggested that the victim had another visitor to his room on the night in question. And moreover, that the victim is a compulsive liar. What? N no, I, I didn't quite say that. The young chin stroker is here to controvert your wild claims conclusively. Is that not so, Mr. Meterman? Eh? Uh, uh, hang on. No, uh, I'm just here. I hereby call for your formal testimonies. You will tell the court as lucidly as possible what happened on the night in question. One may smile and smile and be a villain. Yes, it doth pain me, but let the truth be spoken. The truth of that wintry night of my discontent. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Witness testimony. The wintry night of my discontent. Fair enough. The snow lay about my neighbor did cometh in the evening bearing a gift of tea. But Mary, bitter was his drink 
and when he left I did fall prostrate on my table. Twas the tea alone did pass my lips that late hour, naught else. I was outside this bloke's window in the freezing cold all night, keeping an eye on his room. No one else visited his room but that short little round... Backs? Eastern fella? Round backed? Oh, cause, uh, like hunchbacked, I imagine. Hmm. Wait, what did you say? You were keeping an eye on Mr. Shamspear's room all night? That's right. Of course, the bloke's window is all but blocked up, isn't it? But there's a little gap in the bricks where you can see into the room. So I spent the night trying to keep my teeth from chattering as I peered in through that. The question is, sir, uh, why? Hey, uh, well, uh, now uh, that's because uh, he's on my list. What a piece of work is a man. Wherefore wouldst thou not stare in wonderment? What are you talking about? This buzzing busybody hath no part in this play. I pray thee, pay him no heed. Make no more ado about his tedious words. What did you say about me? Calm yourself. This court is concerned what happened on the night in question. Nothing more. Indeed, and that is so. And, as the testimony we have just heard clearly reveals, there was no one other than the accused present at the time who could have carried out this crime. Well, I believe this may be the final testimony of the trial. Now, counsel, the defense may proceed with the cross-examination. Yes, my lord. Right, here we go then. Let's press and everything, get more info. The wintry night and my discontent. Alright, the snow lay about, my neighbour did cometh in the evening bearing a gift to tea. Hold it! To be clear, by neighbour you are referring to the defendant, Mr. Nasumi. Oh, indeed, sire, but chance thou wouldst thou at I call him the man from upstairs? And at what time did the mustachioed Nipponese visit you in your room? Our meeting was promised for the hour of nine, and lo, did he come to tender a gift of fragrant tea. Details which are in accordance with the defendant's own testimony, yes. And we were broiled in such a literary debate as history hath not seen before. By which I presume he means... The discussion about who was the stronger, Romeo or Juliet. I, Shamspear, did play the part of young Romeo, whilst my neighbour played of the fair Juliet. Each of us dressed as would our characters be, to bring weight upon our merry experiment. I dare not imagine the scene. Frailty, thy name is woman. Canst thou imagine how dismayed I was? Yes, I had heard of the Eastern art of jujitsu, but... Ne'er did I dream it would be a skill practice by the... Comely maid. Juliet beat Romeo up? That is not helping our case. I believe the court has heard enough about your, uh, earth-shattering literary debate. Perhaps you could reiterate your statement about the tea that the accused brought to your room. My liege, I am thy servant. Gladly I would do thy bidding. But Mary, bitter was his drink, and when he left I did fall prostrate at my table. Hold it! Oh, keep pressing it. Let me stop you there. Mr. Natsumi left your room at 11 o'clock. But it wasn't until after two that the poison made you collapse. That amounts to more than three hours of missing time. What are you doing? What? If the defendant had really put the poison in your tea, a three hour window of time is something you're going to have to explain. 
gladly. It is an easy task. What? I did drink of the tea, not while my guest did tarry, but after he took leave of me. Faith, twas stone cold, but at one hour past midnight, verily we were, we were, were my lips parched. Okay. Ugh. That doesn't sound normal. No, it sounds disgusting. Nay, it is quite ordinary, sire. After all, it is not ordinary. Thou wouldst recall our fiery debate. Amidst such argument, there'd be no time for fiery tea. Romeo and Juliet again. And he was stronger. Mr. Shamspear, in summary, allow me to confirm. Did you not come here with the intention of naming your attacker? But of course, my liege. It was the stooped lover of words did attempt to shuffle me off this mortal coil. Uh, we all know what that means. Let's press the next one. Twas the tea alone did pass my lips that late hour, naught else. Hold it. Hold it! So, you didn't have any kind of evening meal? Dinner? Supper? Ha! Huh. Fee on luxury, fee on gluttony. To eat thrice daily is but a waste of time. Sorry? I would that my belly were full, no more oft than the sun doth rise. Well, uh, most heroic eating habits, I must say. Night and day do I fill my hours with learned study of the great bard and playwright. Hence it is that there doth not in my chamber be than the costumes of mine art. And that would appear to be the case, as even a rodent was found starved to death in your room. Oh dear. Now I think of it, it's not just food that was conspicuously missing from that room, is it? Don't recall seeing a single play or script anywhere. For I have devoured them all. Well, literally. You've eaten them? Every word be within my skull. Didst thou imagine otherwise? Right. And that wasn't misleading at all. Now, could you turn around, do you think? Which brings us to the conclusion that the only way the poison could have passed the victim's lips is in the tea. Uh. I was outside the bloke's window in the freezing cold all night, keeping an eye on his room. Hold it! Why? But the windows of the house have all been filled in. Like, sure we know why, but not the real why. There's going to be more to it is what I mean. A historical artifact of the now defunct window tax. Yeah, you're right there. All bricked up horribly. But as it happens, there's a little part of the brickwork at the bottom corner that's been opened up. I was looking it in through that gap. Yes, there were a few bricks loose, weren't there? And for some strange reason, a couple of bars of soap lined up on the ledge outside as well. I don't like going around poking my chin in other people's business, especially on freezing cold nights. But them's my orders, so that's what I'll keep doing, as long as there's breath in my body. What's with all the theatrics today? Out of interest, Mr. Meterman. After the accused had left and returned to his own lodgings. Did you see the victim leave the room at all? No, he never left. He was in the room the old time as far as I'm concerned. And we can therefore discount the possibility of suicide. How can you be sure of that? The police carried out a thorough investigation of the scene and found no receptacle for the poison. And since we know the victim didn't leave his room, and hence didn't dispose of the poison's container himself, it's clear that this was no attempted suicide. Only the culprit could have removed the receptacle. Ah, yes. Uh, lucidly explained, Counsel. Thank you. It really was. You can't argue with that logic. 
Not at the moment, no. No one else visited his room but that short little round backed eastern fella. Hold it! You say a short little round backed eastern fella. So you can't be sure it was the defendant then. Objection! How many of a short little round back nipper knees of a mustache do you think there are in London? Well, of course, it's only a narrow gap and it was quite dark. So I didn't notice the mustache. But he showed up at around nine, so I'm pretty sure of myself. And when the person you saw arrived, did he and Mr. Shamspear drink tea together? Nah, sorry. I couldn't say. Why not? Because I couldn't see into the room all that well, could I? What I did see was the silhouette of that little round backed fella wearing a pretty dress. And the pair of them started some kind of wrestling match. Sorry, I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, I suppose that was the Romeo and Juliet championship battle getting underway. Mr. Meterman, allow me to confirm one final time. Apart from the accused, can you state with certainty that no one else visited the victim on the night in question? No question! Gasman's honor. Hmm. What? It's like... Good heavens. My lord. Goodness me. Uh, yes, Mr. Foreman. I've kept my mouth shut and listened up to now, but this has gone on long enough. Are you all with me? Yes. Are we to understand that you ladies and gentlemen of the jury are in agreement with one another? That you've reached an unanimous decision? Too right we have. Are you all with me? Yes. Wait, no. The defense is in the middle of a cross-examination. To be honest, I was holding out a bit of hope for you, young man. Especially after you identified the few hours that followed the accused leaving the victim's room. Yes, uh, the three missing hours, as you put it. But in the end, what difference do they make? None, as far as I can see. And since that's now apparent, there's really no reason to delay our decision any longer. Like I was saying before, if I don't take five bob home with me tonight, the missus will blow her top. Hmm, <clears throat> what's, what's that? Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. Very well. Let the court be apprised of your decisions. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will state your leanings as to the defendant's culpability. Guilty! Guilty. 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 Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. The fire rises. O all of you? Well, it would appear that the jury is indeed unanimous. Nope. So, this time at least, it seems justice will be done. All's well that ends well, as they say. This calls her a toast, I feel. To the guilty being punished. Ugh. Ugh. Oh my, that's quite... I still want a cup of tea, do you? Get up, Mr. Narahodo. Please. The trial isn't over yet. What do you mean, Miss Suzuto? You know this, mate. What about the information I found in this encyclopedia of British law I have? That obscure right that belongs to the defense in these situations. Remember? Draw yourself up, mate. Come on. Summation examination. Yes. That's right. We don't have a jury in Japanese courts, of course. But here in the British court of law, we can reverse the decision of a majority of the jurors. We can force the trial to continue. 
This trial can't end now. He's back. Whatever it takes, I just can't let that happen. The defense moves to invoke its right to a summation examination, my lord. I thought you might. Why am I not surprised? At my learned Nipponese friend's inability to admit defeat. You choose to cling desperately to some archaic rule you barely comprehend instead of accepting the truth. Certainly no other defense counsel in recent times has exercised the right to a summation examination. Because they all know that once the jury's mind is set, it cannot be altered. We've done it several times already, mate. You know it's, it, it, it's possible. Nevertheless, the right remains and must be upheld. The defense counsel's request is granted. The court will proceed with a summation examination as outlined in the Encyclopedia of British Law. Thank you, my lord. Are you and your fellows prepared, Mr. Foreman? Believe me, my lord, we know all about this young lad's tenacity, and we're ready for it. Very well. In that case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I hereby call upon each of you to state the grounds upon which you find the defendant guilty of the crime for which he stands accused. Here we go. Judicial findings. The jurors' contentions. The victim may not be well off, but he's a noble man and straight up. There's no reason to doubt the man. Well, I do declare the good gentleman has no reason to lie. In fact, I think he's rather splendid. Oh, just look at the accused by comparison. He's Japanese, stoops all the one and has a mustache. Very fishy. There's no evidence to suggest the gangling actor is a fraudsman. For now, at least. Oh, I really don't care, like, I just need this trial to end quickly. Three hours of missing time is nothing when you reach my age, you know. <laughs> nothing at all. Alright, Santa. I knew it. Every single one of them seems completely convinced. It would seem that all the jurors have come to the conclusion that Mr. Shamspear is a fine, upstanding and honest citizen. Trust me, they've all been bewitched by his strange theatrical movements. And sadly, nothing Mr. Natsumi has said appears to have registered at all. Well, here goes. Let's not forget. I pleaded with the jury on Soseki san's half before. And it worked. So you never know. Before we begin, it might be an idea for me to remind you exactly how a summation examination works, Mr. Narahoda. Oh. Well, still very new to British law, after all. I mean, it would help you. That's true, I suppose. And Soseki san's fate is entirely in my hands now, too. There's always a chance I might have forgotten some crucial detail. Perhaps I should hear Suzuto san out. I wonder. Should I let her talk me through it again? Or not bother? Refresh my memory. Alright. So, if you remember, the key to changing the juror's mind is the things that they say themselves. Yes, it's coming back to me. First, it's important to listen very carefully to each juror's statement. Then... It sounds as though one of the statements might contradict another. I have to pit the corresponding two jurors against each other to prove one or the other of them wrong. Yes, that's right. In many ways, it's very similar to a normal cross-examination. Alright then. All that remains now is to do it. Without further ado, please, counsel, proceed with the summation examination. Yes, my lord. And so it begins. Jury examination. The defense's rebuttal. The victim may not be well off, but he's a noble man and straight up. There's no reason to doubt the man. Okay. Well, I do declare the good gentleman has no reason to lie. In fact, I think he's rather splendid. Just look at the accused by comparison. He's Japanese. Stoops all the while has a mustache very fishy. 
No evidence suggests the gangling, gangling actor is a fraudsman, for now at least. So that's going to compete with us, surely. I really don't care, like, I just need this trial to end quickly. Three hours of missing time is nothing when you reach my age, you know, nothing at all. I feel like this one's a bit contradictory. So let's go with the uh, press on that one. What do you mean for now? A fraudsman? What do you mean by that, madam? It really is a most tiresome problem for the company. Most irritating. We can be absolutely certain that a customer is stealing from us, but without hard evidence. We can't even threaten to take action for fear of being sued. I'm sorry, you've lost me a little there. Who are you? I'm the wife of Augustus Altamont, owner of the Altamont Gas Company. Oh. Good gracious. Altamont Gas, you say? Gas is the future of energy in this country and around the globe. <laughs> but proper handling is essential. As I'm sure our employee from the East End branch office would be the first to agree. Absolutely, Lady Quimby. Gotta be used properly. Altamont Gas is the best in the world, of course. I think we may have solved the mystery of the bow from earlier, Mr. Narahoda. Right, he bowed in the deference to his employer's wife. Did he? Ah, so would I be right in assuming that the reason Mr. Meaterman was watching what Mr. Shamsby was up to in his room I'm afraid that there's no end to the lengths the population of the East End will go in order to steal our gas. So I really have no choice when the company identifies somebody as a possible fraudsman. But to dispatch a worker to watch the suspect day and night. We're very thorough in our investigations. So you mean, Mr. Shamsby is? I wouldn't come out and say it in public. But you can finish that sentence with a Grubby little gas thief. You have noticed the public gallery in here, have you? The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Faith, wouldst thou wound me with thy words, were I to let them penetrate the skin. But seraphs here not insults, only choirs of angels in song. We may not have evidence yet, but my workers won't stop buzzing around you until they find it. And when they do, you'll find yourself blasted back to your angelic heights in an altamont gas explosion. So Mr. Shamspear has been stealing gas. I wonder, juror number four, if you wouldn't mind adding that information to your statement. My pleasure. Was it the bit about ripping the thief apart you enjoyed? A little before that part about abject violence, if it's not too much trouble. Yes, of course. This could be it. This could shift the balance. The victim puts on a fine performance, but in reality, is a common thief of my company's guess. Right, so who do we compare it up with? Who do we pit it against? Just look at the accused by comparison. He's Japanese. No, not you. Well, I do declare the good gentleman has no reason to lie. In fact, I think he's rather splendid. The victim may not be well off, but he's a noble man and straight up. There's no reason to doubt the man. I'm gonna say that we end this part here. And in the next part, we pit juror number four against juror number one and see what we get. That might be the way of going about it. Because he's, he's, there's, there's reason to doubt the man as a result of that. But we may need to press him. But I want to just try pitting at this point and see if that's enough. But we'll see about that at the start of the next part. Ta-da for now.